All right, I'm here with Todd Rosenbluth, Director of Research here at Vetify. Todd, been a big year in ETFs, not a ton of flows, but a lot of activity. What's innovative and interesting to you right now? So what we have seen a lot of is actively managed ETFs. They are roughly a third, 25 to 30, 35% of the flows that we've seen through the first four plus months of the year. We've seen Capital Group, we've seen American Century with the Avantis brand, Dimensional Funds, JP Morgan in particular. Plus all the fixed income guys who were already here, right? Fidelity was already there, PIMCO was already there. We had a raft of those. Are they generating real new assets or most, is most of this coming from conversions? So the money that's coming in this year is net new money. There haven't been any conversions. In fact, dimensional funds that converted funds en masse a couple of years ago has actually seen net inflows, uh, close to $10 billion for a capital group. JP Morgan is, of course, the heavyweight in that space. They've got the two largest of the actively managed Jeppy, ETFs. Jeppy yeah. passed JPST, the active fixed income ultra short ETFs. That was, I guess, a key milestone is that we're now back to equity ETFs, at least on the number one spot of the products gaining traction. So we've seen growth there. We've seen growth actually in defined outcome or the buffered ETFs from Innovator in particular, but we've seen it with First Trust and Allianz, uh, to name a couple of other firms that have had it. They've seen some nice traction this year. The volatility in the equity marketplace makes those products all the more compelling. You, as you know, you protect the downside for uh, investors, but participate in some of the upside so that's where we've seen some of the, the growth. And then April, uh, and now starting into May, we've started to see some of the traditional beta-oriented products uh, see inflows, investors wanting to capture some of that strength that they've seen. So the Vanguard 500 ETF, VU, uh, iShares Core S&P 500 started to gain traction. At the NASDAQ uh, QQQM, uh, the That's cheaper. where all the action's been, right? Yes. I mean, all the money has been out of the large queues and into the small queues, largely because of price, one yeah. assumes, right? Cost still matters right. to many investors, and especially if it's the same product. I know, you know, I'm a big believer that what's inside an ETF matters, but when what's <laughs> inside is the it's same literally thing. Literally the same Why thing. Why not just pay right. less money? to have it. And so that's why VU is gaining share over SPY. QQQM is gaining share with over the triple Qs of a couple of those examples. One thing we haven't seen a lot of, it seems, has been a lot of smart beta product, a lot of factor-based product. Now, some of those funds have done pretty well. We had a window where Minval was really outperforming. We recently celebrated the anniversary of RSP being on the scene, sort of the first of the smart betas, if you will, the dumbest of the smart betas, right? Just equal weight, the S&P 500. Do you think that advisors have lost their appetite for those quant solutions and are instead looking to active managers for much of what they would have gotten out of some sort of multi-factor product? So yes and no. So we are seeing money go into active management that might have gone into smart beta when that was the only game in town to get exposure to active like strategies at a competitively cost uh, situation. The active ETFs we talked about earlier, Dimensional Funds has products that cost around 20, 25 basis points overall. Same thing with JP Morgan, the Capital Group ETF that's leading the charge there, Dividend Value ETF, I think it's 33 basis points. So this is really cheap for active management. Yeah. Um, whereas you can get index-based products uh, for 15 basis points, the smart beta ones that are there. What's been popular this year has been quality. Yeah, anything that looks index. like quality, dividends, anything throwing off revenue, anything that's like a proxy for viable company status. Yet at the same time, it's been a lot of the large cap tech that's really rocketed the market on those days when it comes back. I mean, it's very much a bifurcated market with a handful of winners and a whole lot of losers. Do you feel like there's a shift that advisors may be having around like, look, we got to get back to our knitting. We're not going to go after all these crazy new ideas the industry comes up with. I certainly hear that from advisors that like they're simplifying their portfolios. They are. I think they are. Um, and what we're seeing, I thought where you were going was so much money, so the, the market's being led by a handful of stocks. So what do you do? So you can do one of two things. You can believe the rally isn't right. going to be there. And that means most stocks are down for the year that maybe you want to pair back or you want to reduce the risk profile. SPLV has been actually very popular. That's the Invesco S&P 500 low volatility ETF. It started to see inflows in, or not started, but it saw inflows in April. Um, we've seen some multi-factor oriented products. OMFL, again, I'm naming Invesco products that are top of mind, but we're also seeing 
that investors are interested, starting to look more interested in value oriented ETFs. It's something that we're writing more uh, from a research perspective. I've been working on it uh, earlier today as to do you believe the pendulum is going to swing back again towards value if you if you don't, if those growth stocks have run so far so fast as of late, um, does it make, does a value oriented approach or at least an, even an actively managed value oriented approach make sense in this environment? Interesting you bring up OMFL back when that was an Oppenheimer product back in the day. That was one of the first outperforming multi-factor funds we had. It had about a, I think about a two year window where it was beating all comers in the multi-factor space. Then the whole space seemed to die out and now it seems to be coming back. It must just be the, the bifurcation in the markets, right? When you create that much divergence in returns, sometimes those factor strategies are going to work. Yeah, and that product in particular, as you, as you probably know, can rotate. So it is, it's, the, it's five right. factors, but it can rotate where the exposure is as to some other multi-factor ETFs. It owns quality and value and size, and it only owns those. The stocks inside rotate, but not necessarily the factors. Right. Well, we, we've been talking about active and you mentioned fixed income, but this has been a year for fixed yeah, income. Yeah, I was going to say, we got to pivot to fixed income yeah. here because the flows have definitely been there. I mean, everybody all of a sudden knows how to get 4% out of the bond market. So everybody's doing that. But at the same time, I've talked to some advisors that are just absolutely avoiding credit at all costs. I have a, a webinar later this month with Eric Beagleisen from 3Edge. Their core model is 100% treasuries right now. Their really? core moderate model, no equities whatsoever, no other credits, just government issued securities. That strikes me as incredibly conservative, and we'll get to that with Eric at some point. But is there an issue in the bond market where there's just not that much interesting for investors to do there? It's just duration and credit? Well, yes. I mean, it is just duration and credit. And so you can either hide under the mattress with your ultra short bond ETF, whether that's a treasury oriented product like Bill, BIL from State Street. Um, or SHY, which is an iShares product. Or more of a managed approach, like an, a mint or something yeah, like so, that. Right, yeah, so right, right. Like, the yeah. cash like actively managed ETFs. I think we are going to see now that it's quite possible that we just had the latest and last Fed rate hike for a period of time, that that could cause folks to pay a little bit more to rate, more attention towards the middle of the curve um, and take on a little bit more rate risk intermediate term products or active products that are in the core or the core plus variety. And that's where we've seen so many active managers that have an offering. So they, they have entered active fixed right. income more than they've entered with active equity. But we've got firms, uh, I could name them all, I'm probably going to yeah. forget <laughs> some and then we're going to end up having people wonder why do we leave them out. But everybody who has an active mutual fund that entered the ETF marketplace now has a core, core plus fixed income product. And they're perfectly appropriate for this kind of environment. I think you did it in the Vetify Voices. Why would you want to try to manage this yourself? Yeah, well, that's the thing that's really nuts is that the, the corners of the market that look the juiciest when I talk to PMs are often the ones that are hardest to cover as an individual investor. So for instance, like PIMCO has a loan fund, I think it's loans is actually yeah. the name of it, um, that's done quite well and has some really interesting exposures. That's a market that's basically inaccessible as a retail investor. I mean, there's no way you're gonna figure out how to pick that one credit out of the giant basket uh, that, that is gonna yield that excess return, which you're, is what you're hoping to get. I'm wondering if there's a, an opportunity here for more packaged products around these fixed income strategies. I see the active strategies. I understand the case there. But is there like a smart beta version of this for fixed income that we're ever really going to see? Well, we have smart beta fixed income products that are tied to managing the duration risk. Goldman Sachs has a whole yeah, suite yeah. of those products that are smarter, at least in the intention, than the traditional issue weighted index-based approach, whether that's the corporate bonds uh, or investment-grade corporate bonds, GIGB, G-I-G-B is, is one of the tickers that comes to mind, but they've got a high-yield version. I think they even have an emerging market debt uh, product as well. You've got Invesco that has these products, iShares launch these products. There just wasn't money going into it. Perhaps now is the time to be able to do so, especially as we talk about smart beta coming back again, perhaps uh, with a quality tilt towards some of these strategies. I don't think, what we perhaps could see more of are these fund of fund strategies. Uh, I don't think so. Where, we, where, somebody's on where somebody's managing which ones of those products and rotating in 
uh, based on the, the investment style. I, I don't see there being a big market for that. I mean, the one ticker problem is a real issue with financial advisors, certainly. I've had many advisors tell me, I don't care how great your model is, if you put it in one ticker, I can't use that with my client. I can't tell them I'm putting all of their money in some balanced fund, no matter how great it is. The flip side of that is we now have the tools in the fixed income side to do some really interesting stuff. You've got the sector stuff from bond blocks. We've got lots of target maturity and you know uh, specific duration models. So if you are a bond nerd, there are a lot of tools to play with. But I haven't seen anybody really rolling it up in a particularly compelling fashion just in the bond space. It feels like there's still some green field there. So a couple of things to it. One, yes, a shout out to Bond Blocks because they've got some of those unique products that are out there. If you want to choose not only your duration with with, with a single treasury product and there's a couple like other financials firms, versus tech and all of that, but being yeah. able to overweight right yeah. within the high yield space. But what we've started to see is some of those asset managers that we talked about earlier that have a huge following within the balanced world have shown some success with fund to fund strategy or they think they're going to. So Dimensional Funds launched a fund of equity mm -hmm. ETFs, again, equity, not fixed income, that launched in September that already crossed $100 million in assets under management. I'm failing to remember the ticker off the top of my head because 3,000 of them are bouncing around in, <laughs> in, the, in, the, in this head and I'm not as, as, as young as I used to be. And then Capital Group has launched, or not launched, has filed to do a, a balanced uh, ETF that it's going to include equities from a stock picking perspective and then using their own, likely their own fixed income ETFs to get that exposure. Capital Group and Dimensional they have probably, certainly yeah. proven that they know how to bring in money into asset allocation strategies. Not in ETFs yet. It feels, it but, feels like that's a retail play as much as yes. anything. I think the average advisor isn't going to touch that. I think the average institution is not even going to look at it, right? Because they do that on their own. But from an advisor perspective, it seems like that's just competing directly with model portfolios, right? I mean, if you're if you're going to go in all in on a capital group single ticker ETF that's balancing out your credit exposure and your duration and your equity exposure and managing your international sleeve, there's not nothing left for the model provider to be there doing and I think that's a real issue in this industry. Right, but but advisors as you know add value in other ways besides the security side and so for some folks that's for smaller account sizes that's just an easy thing to be able to do um, or to be able to manage that as a core and then build around that using, you know, you have that as your core and then you add individual securities or individual tickers to build around it. That's yeah. related to it. I think that's. I think there's a real opportunity there in retail. I think. I think as much as we had the Robin Hood re Robin Hood revolution over the uh, over the pandemic, I still think retail is pretty significantly uncovered by ETFs to the extent it could be. Right, right. and so, where we are seeing retail is more thematic oriented ETFs. Uh, whether that's the Global X suite of products, iShares has them. Uh, other firms that are offering disruptive technology products, either index-based or actively managed. And that's a part where we see sticky assets. So it, it'll rotate in. This has been a year for more of the growth-oriented strategies, artificial intelligence. I know I'm getting into your world <laughs> of, of where we go head yeah. for, the, for the future, but we are seeing people rotate back into those strategies because they're performing quite well. Yeah, I think it's going to be tricky to to draw a line in the sand on any of those types of strategies while we still have, well, frankly, during an election cycle. I mean, I think the next 18 months are, is completely dominated by global macro trends. And so it's, I think it's tough for any of those themes to get enough airspace, right? To get enough room to move to show that they can prove anything because three weeks from now, we're gonna be back at arguing about the debt ceiling. And once that over, there'll be something else that we're arguing about. Uh, and then it'll be whether or not we're going to get a cut or whether we're going to hold pad on the Fed. And all those things seem to dwarf even the right ideas. I mean, if you look at um, some of the AI-based funds, if you look at, uh, you know, everything from cannabis to DeFi, like you name a theme that's been really popular over the last two or three years, it's been very tough for them to break out of the headline cycle, which is what you need for that to be a great long-term investment. If right. you're just buying it to trade and get the pop from a good headline, that's one thing. But as long-term plays, do you think there's still an appetite for really playing into a theme for two, three, five, ten years? Well, I do think that the people who are in them are in them for the longer term. So we had really tough performance last year 
for most thematic oriented ETFs, and we didn't see the outflows, and we didn't see the inflows either. Well, People were the case in point, right? Arc, like, right, just fortress arc. Yeah, <laughs> right. Arc being the the poster child still for thematic investing, despite the up and down right. performance that's there. But even some of the other products, we've seen people seem to be in it for the intermediate term. The long term, I don't know, but certainly for the intermediate term, they waited it out. Then they'll maybe add to it when things are down. Um, and have confidence in these trends. And, and if you believe in the trend that robotics or artificial intelligence or healthcare technology, among others, is going to be disruptive for the future, it isn't in 2023 where we're going to see all of that play out. It's probably going to be in five years down the road. And so you want to be in there for the longer term. But I remember back in the day when I had hair, when I was a financial advisor, and you would try to pick one or two of the stocks that could fit one of these right. themes. Oh my goodness, I wish we had ETFs. Uh, well, and now we've got the super narrow ones like Round Hills, yes. you know, five stock portfolios, which is, you know, a bit of a hack around that. But, you know, I th there's no limit to how far you can slice and dice these things. It's just a question of what the appetite's going to be. But my goodness, if we're going to, let's stick with Round Hill for a second. The timing on that, they launched a bank, uh, you know, the six largest bank uh that make it into the ETF, big B I G B, a big B, yeah. um, is the ticker on that. Just at the same time that the regional <laughs> banks all went under and money was moving towards these larger banks, so it's the perfect example of the ETF industry can be nimble, uh, it can shift where it is, and I think it's a it's a narrative that works. One thing that's been fun to see is that you know you and I've been in this business now for four hundred years or something, and. <laughs> It wasn't that long ago, five, maybe 10 years ago, where there would be these cool niche products that we would love because they're doing something really cool. And they get like $4 million out of, you know, ahead yeah. of seed. And then they just have to shut them down because they were still too expensive for even a large issuer to run. That seems to have stopped largely. I mean, even some of the, what I would call more exploratory products from folks like, I don't know, Simplify or Innovator, places where, you know, you're not necessarily expecting each one of those to be absolutely on fire. Those products now have like 50, 100 million dollars in them. They're viable products, even if they're not the billion dollar headliners. That's exciting to me because it means some of these products will actually stick around through a full cycle, which is which has not always been the case. I mean, we've talked many times about the the dustbin of ETF history where like, yeah, that was a good idea, but nobody put any money in it. That was a good idea. Nobody put any money in it. Now it seems like there's enough retail, there's enough institutional that even some of the smaller products become viable. Are there any in that mix that you're particularly keen on that you're excited to see survive? Well, I what what you were I'll try to come up with an example or two <laughs> in in a moment. But what just was exciting because people talk about how concentrated the ETF industry is. You still have iShares and BlackRock, yeah, I'm sorry, and Vanguard yeah. and State Street uh, dominating the overall flows. But we are seeing more mid-sized or even newer entrants come into the marketplace and have success. Now, they're not going to be successful with all of their products, and we'll see firms come out with something, see it doesn't work, um, especially if we've seen, you know, we've seen closures this year. Some of that are products that have been around for you know, nearly a decade that just were sitting on the shelf uh, dying, uh, and just it makes sense to put them out of their misery right. uh, and bring in something that's newer and fresh, and that's gonna come from some of those larger asset managers. So I do think what's exciting is we're seeing these more moderately sized firms have some success and be able to do it in a way that, that continues to gain traction. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, Todd, thanks for spending some time chatting today. My pleasure, thanks a lot. That was fun? Yeah. <laughs>